My name is Andrei Belenko. I am a chief security researcher at Telcomsoft, and today I would like to talk about uh, IOS data protection and more specifically about uh, the implications the, this technology had on, on iPhone forensics. So, uh, I will start by giving a short overview of the iPhone forensic techniques, then we'll move on to the pre iOS 4 forensics. We'll um, talk a little bit about iOS 3 forensics and how that worked. Uh, we'll then describe an iOS 4 data protection technologies in more detail and move on to the uh, iOS 4 forensics and how this can be accomplished uh, with respect to the data protection. Uh, so, uh, when it comes to, to computer forensics, there are traditionally three steps. Uh, the first one is acquisition, uh, the second one is analysis, and the third one is reporting. And we will talk mostly about acquisition today. Uh, the goal of the acquisition is to acquire as, as much information from the device as possible. It doesn't matter what the device is, is it a computer or mobile device or something else. And uh, we also would like to leave as little traces on the device as possible to make the, the evidence, um, like forensically, to be usable in court. So when it comes to iPhone forensics, there are traditionally two general ways of, of doing the acquisition. The first one is to utilize the uh, built-in function of the iOS to ask the device to create a backup of, of, of itself. And uh, this method is very good in the sense that it's very non-invasive. So it doesn't alter the device, so the device contents are not changed, it doesn't require any sort of hacking of the device. Um, the downsides, however, are that uh, the amount of information which is available uh, with this way is very limited, and the, um, the exact information which is included in the, back in the backup depends on the particular um, version of the iOS the device is running, and it can be changed. For example, Apple can easily change the amount of information which is included in the backup uh, in the upcoming iOS 5, for example. Um, the second problem with the backup approach is that if the device is passcode protected, um, it will not create a backup. You just cannot ask the device if it's locked to, to create the backup. You need to unlock the device first. You have to know the passcode or you have to get the so-called escrow keys from the, from the computer. I will talk about this later. And the third major problem is that uh, iOS device can be configured in, in such a way that it will produce encrypted backups. So you ask the device to create a backup of itself, it gives you an encrypted backup, and after that you need to run a password cracking at attack on this backup, and this may be successful or it may not, so it depends. So the second general approach is to utilize some sort of uh, boot time exploit to load custom RAM disk and custom kernel on the device and perform the physical or logical acquisition. The difference between physical and logical here is that uh, physical acquisition uh, obtains a raw disk image, so it's like uh, running a DD on the iPhone. It basically it is the running the DD on the iPhone. And the logical acquisition is uh, just obtaining individual files some of them or all of them from the device file system. So that's the difference. Um, the obvious benefit here is that uh, this approach can get you all information which is stored on the device. Uh, passcode is generally not a problem for the acquisition itself, although it may be a problem for the later analysis stage. Again, I will talk about this uh, a little later. Um, the problems, uh, there are two downsides. The first, that uh, we need a boot ROM exploit, boot time exploit, which is, uh, well, it limits the scope of this attack. For example, there are, at this time, there is no boot time exploit, public boot time exploit for an iPad 2. So this device is currently not, uh, cannot be acquired like physical acquisition. And the second problem is that uh, raw images which we can acquire this, with this method can be, uh, can, can be encrypted. And actually this is uh, the motivation be uh, behind our research. Because the initial uh, physical dumps of the iPhone 4s, then it came out, showed that the uh, raw images of the disk, they're quite strange. They have the 
the file system structures in plain text, so you can see the files, the directory tree, and all these kind of things. But when you try to read the file contents, they're encrypted. So that's it. Um, there are three major aspects of the uh, forensics of the iPhone security when it comes to forensics. There are storage encryption, keychain encryption, and password protection. So um, in iOS 3, it was pretty easy, all of these parts. And I will start with this encry storage encryption. Well, first of all, before iPhone 3GS, uh, there were no uh, hardware encryption. So the storage was not encrypted on the devices, no matter what version of the iOS uh, they are running. For example, the iPhone 3G, even if, if it's running iOS 4, there is no storage encryption. Uh, on the compatible devices with the hardware encryption uh, running iOS 3, the data was actually encrypted, uh, but the encryption was there not to provide data confidentiality, but it was to ensure that uh, fast wipe is possible. So the data was encrypted and decrypted by the, by the device automatically and transparently to the application. So it created no problems for um, logical or physical acquisitions. Uh, the keychain is a system-wide storage for secrets like passwords. Mm, on iOS 3, all items in the keychain were encrypted using the same key. The key is known as security D key or key uh, 830. 35 hex. Um, the problem with this approach is that uh, this device key, security D key, is, uh, is fixed for the, is constant for the lifetime of the device. So, uh, in fact, uh, since all the keychain items were encrypted using this key, this key uh, it meant that all past, current, and future keychain items for the given device they can be decrypted if, we, if you manage to get this, this key. This is, is not a very good thing to do. Uh, and the layout of the keychain um, key chain item is, is shown on the screen. There is a random IV and data pil encrypted payload which, which contains the, the data itself, the, usually the password uh, along with the uh, digest for um, integrity checks and padding. Um, Another thing with iOS 3 is that device passcode is, if set, it was stored in the, in the keychain. So if you manage to read the keychain contents, you can just recover the passcode instantly. And there were no additional protections with regard to the passcode um, besides the, the lock screen. So it was very artificial. So um, the iOS 4 introduced the thing which is called data protection, which is a set of uh, security measures to protect data at rest. So there, mm, with regard to the mobile forensics, there were three new things. The storage encryption, the iTunes backup, and keychain encryption. Those things were different in iOS 4. Uh, well, the, the iTunes backup was not a big deal for forensics because starting day zero, there was a proprietary tools to deal with that. Um, for storage, there were no tools until recently. Um, and as, as I have described, the, the file system encryption is, is not very typical. I mean that the file system metadata, the directory tree, and all these kind of things were decrypted, uh, but the f file, file contents were actually encrypted. So um, before I can describe the encryption of the keychain and the storage, I need to take a little detour and to explain some internals of the data protection on iOS 4. Um, iOS 4 uh, introduces a concept of um, so-called um, key bags. Key bag is a collection of encryption keys. And uh, it also introduces the concept of uh, content protection classes. iOS uh, defines several content protection classes which correspond to several, to three uh, accessibility domains which are also defined for, for all the data which is stored on the device. So those accessibility domains are uh, the data available only when the device is unlocked. Now, the data is available only after the device was uh, unlocked for the first time and it, the data remains available until the device is switched off or reset. And the data is available at all times, no matter the device locked on or unlocked. Uh, so there is a content I'm sorry, you know, content protection class for all of these uh, accessibility domains. 
Uh, there are separate protection classes for, for user files and for keychain items. And each protection class uses its own encryption key, which we will call the master key for this particular protection class. And each such master key is stored in the key bag, in the system key bag, in the scroll key bag, and uh, it is protected with the device key, which is unique to the particular device, and optionally with the passcode key, which is uh, unique to, to the passcode. So it depends on the passcode. Uh, and what's important that uh, these key bags and content protection keys, they are regenerated, recreated every time you, 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 you run the device restore. So if you just need to wipe the device, you can um, like restore the device to default settings in the iTunes. And this will recreate all the content protection keys and all keys which can be, which possibly could have been compromised before, they will not be of any use with the new device. So uh, the whole system looks pretty much like this. Um, so there are two device keys. There is one hardware key, which is in red, which is UID key, which is embedded in hardware. And uh, it is used to, to create, to compute two device keys, the key security key and uh, key 890B. Uh, and there is a special area on the iOS devices which is called a faceable storage. It is, uh, its purpose is to store uh, small amounts of data which uh, may require a um, fast wipe. So this is the name, a faceable storage. And on iOS 4, it, it, is, it's, it stores uh, three encryption keys. So the first one is uh, EMF key, which is a file system whitening key. It acts pretty much like a default encryption key for user data partition. Uh, all data which is uh, not a file with a, with a certain protection class is encrypted using this uh, whitening key. So all the file system metadata and files with, for, for which uh, no content protection class is explicitly set, uh, those files are encrypted with whitening key. The second one is the bag one key, which is uh, um, an encryption key which is used to protect the payload of the system key back file. The system key back is stored on the, on, the, on the file, on the file system, and its payload, its contents are um, encrypted with the back one key. And the third key is KD, DK. Uh, it is actually a um, class four protection key. It really belongs to the, to the system key back, uh, and it, this is shown on the, on, the, on the screen. And the reason it is stored in effaceable storage is because um, System key bag itself is stored in the file, and the file is encrypted on this D key, and you can't really store encryption key to decrypt the file in the file itself. This introduced some, some sort of conflict. You can't really decrypt it. So this is why it is stored in, in effaceable storage. Mm. So the ultimate secrets which, which are required to decrypt all data on the device I mean, data belonging to all content protection classes um, is system is a complete set of uh, unlocked content protection keys, and there are actually two ways to to obtain them. Uh, as you can see here, the unlock um, the unlock uh, requires that you provide uh, two keys. The first one is device key, and the second one is passcode key. Well, the obtaining device key is relatively easy. Obtaining the system key back in the locked state is also pretty, uh, relatively easy, but obtaining the passcode key might be uh, difficult. And um, it may require the passcode brute force because there is no simple way to just extract it from somewhere. In iOS 4, passcode recovery requires an, um, a device because the uh, passcode transformation, the passcode key derivation function uh, is tied to the hardware key and you cannot run this outside of the device. Um, and the problem with this is that pass passcode brute force is really slow. Um, we have to do this on the device so we can't use, we can't really use any of these fancy GPUs or stuff. And the password recovery speed depends greatly on the device. For example, on the iPhone 3G, it is about two passcodes per second, and on an iPad, it's more like seven passcodes per second. Uh, 
but there are still two, two things which make it possible to, to recover the passcode. The first one is the human factor. Nobody likes long passwords, no, maybe except a few guys. Uh, but pretty much everyone is using the simple passcode, which is four digits, or not using a passcode at all. And the second factor which helps is that system keyback actually stores the, the type of the passcode which is used to protect the, the, the device. Just by looking on the system keyback, you can um, tell with 100% certainty that whether this particular user is using simple passcode or not. So, and if you have a confirmation that the passcode is simple, which is four digits, then you can easily spend like 10 or maybe 20 minutes and get a passcode just by brute forcing all possibilities. There are not too many of them, just 10,000. So, but if there is an alphanumeric password, then this is not an option. This can take like weeks or months and uh, usually during forensics there are no such time frames. So there's another option of obtaining the complete set of unlocked content protection keys and this is the iOS 4 escrow keybag. Escrow keybag uh, holds the same content protection keys as the system keybag. It is created by the iTunes the first time the uh, device is connected to the uh, computer in the, in the unlocked state. Uh, the keyback itself is stored on the computer, on the PC or on Mac, and it is protected with a random 256-bit passcode, and the passcode is stored on the device. So there, there is a sort of, the, the keyback is stored on the computer and the passcode is stored on the device, and you still need the device to compute the escrow uh, escrow key to unlock this key bag. But if you have both the escrow key bag and the device, then you obviously don't need the passcode. And this is the good thing. <clears throat> so this was a sort of long introduction about the iOS 4 internals and uh, iOS 4 data protection internals. And now we can move to the actual iOS uh, 4 keychain and storage encryption. Uh, the keychain encryption um, provides six protection classes. Uh, they're parallel to the accessibility domains, uh, accessible always, accessible after first unlock, and accessible only when unlocked. And it also provides three additional classes which are duplicates of those, but with this device only suffix. And uh, items with this suffix, they will not migrate to another device. So they're encrypted in a way that they, they cannot be decrypted on a different device other from, from the one created them. Um, each item is encrypted using a unique key. And this uh, encryption key, which is specific to a to, to particular uh, keychain item, is then protected with the master uh, content protection key. And uh, everything is stored in the keychain, in the, which is a SQLite 3 database. So there is no it's, it's no longer possible to have to extract one key from the device and uh, get the ability to, to decrypt keychain contents for life for this device. Um, the storage encryption, there are two documented protection classes, the protection known, which is uh, accessible always, and protection complete, which is accessible only when unlocked. And for example, uh, built-in uh, mail application on the iPhone 4 uses the NS protection complete uh, to protect the uh, email databases, so they are only accessible when when device is unlocked. Um, file system metadata and files without any protection class are encrypted using a whitening key. Um, each file is encrypted uh, on random key, unique key, and this key is then protected with the uh, content protection key, and uh, this protected key is stored in the extended attribute of, the, of that file. Now, uh, this is the problem which, which we faced uh, with the raw images. When you obtain a raw image of the, of, the, of the disk and try to decrypt the files, you will get garbage. It will, they will not decrypt. The problem is that when you read the block device, everything gets decrypted on the whitening key. So actually, to decrypt the file, you, you need first to encrypt it using the whitening key and only then decrypt with the uh, unique file key. So this is pretty much it. I have just to sum things up. Um, 
I asked for forensics. There is, it, it's no longer enough to acquire a disk, raw disk image of the device. You need also to extract the encryption keys from the device. And also, you might want to extract, extract the whitening key from the effaceable storage. Uh, now, you can theoretically, there are two approaches. You can theoretically extract only the green uh, items, uh, which are the unlocked keys and the whitening key. But in real world, it might be way better to extract the source data. I mean, the device keys, the passcode key, and the effaceable storage. Uh, this will give you more flexibility if something is wrong with the, with the device or with the keys or something is damaged. So you can rerun the process of computing the keys and all these kind of things. Uh, and to conclude, um, with uh, this research, the iPhone physical analysis is possible again. Um, the problem is that uh, such physical acquisition requires boot time exploit. Passcode is usually not a problem, uh, either because it's not set, it's simple, or these crow keys are available. And uh, it's also worth mentioning that there are proprietary and open source tools are available, and uh, there are independent research group at Sugeti who actually gave a very similar presentation somewhere in between our submission to Black Hat and the Black Hat. Um, and they did all this research independently, and they actually maintain the open source repository for the same tools, and we provide proprietary tools. And thank you very much. Uh, please turn in your completed feedback forms at the registration desks, and uh, if you have any questions, if you want, um, we can run the questions? Okay, if you have any questions, you can ask them now. We have five minutes. Yep. Yes, I am. You can look at, the, at my title. <laughs> no problem. Actually, I'm one of the developers of this toolkit. So if you have any questions. <laughs> oh, if, if anyone wants to see a demo, we will be available until end of Black Hat and for DeefCon. So just find us. And thank you very much.